Okay, I think that'll work. Hello and welcome to World of Monsters. I'm Monster Master Arthur, and today's monster is going to be introduced to you by AJ Pickett, a friend of mine and a fellow Monster Master out there. So, take it away, AJ. Hello, everybody. My name is AJ Pickett. You can find me on YouTube, AJ Pickett. Um, and my channel is called The Mighty Clustic. I also love monsters, so you should check out some of my videos, including one that I've made on this very monster that Arthur is going to be covering today, which is the Chimera, a creature of real world mythology and legend stretching way back. So I'm greatly looking forward to the amount of research that Arthur puts into his videos. He always knocks them out of the park. And uh, if you get time, come check out my channel. I'll be happy to see you. Take it away, Arthur. Thanks a lot and well done, AJ. And please do check out his channel after this video. Whoa. Now that was a chimera. No, no, not the fish. Also known as the ghost shark. Yes, this insane beast hybrid of three. Here, let me, let me try something here. Let me see, how do you do this? All right, let's, uh, is this. Ready, ready? All right, watch this. Two, three. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's there. Let's see, let's see how this works out today. All right, so the Chimera or Chimera, according to the Wikipedia, whatever creature that is, Chinese chime, screw it, Chimera works fine as well. It's not only a mysterious mix of animals, as you will find out after we explore its origin. So let's get into that right now. Hmm. Yes, Greek lore has some mentioning of the Chimera, but after deep analysis, we find that its foundation may go much further back in our human timeline. Indeed, this creature can be tracked down to Lycia, or ancient Greek Lucia, the southern piece of Asia Minor, or what today is known as Turkey. But what of this biological hybrid disaster before being popularized in Greek lore, before Typhon and Echidna, before Homer's tales? Beginning with ancient Lucia, a 4th century writing by author Servius Honoratus speculates the Chimera to be a representation of a volcano, a mountain named Chimera. Now the most questionable feature about the Chimera, among many, is the goat's head protruding out of the center of its lion body. This is what really sparks further research. Now a volcano or a mountain or the smoke of a volcano being mistaken for a Chimera? Hmm, sounds somewhat unlikely, but, well, anything's possible, right? But why and how that goat's head? What does that have to do with the whole lion figure and shape? I mean, the lion's tail does have that tuft of fur at the end that at least has somewhat of a form to it that could be imagined of as a snake's head, but the horned and bearded silhouette of a goat? Hmm. Okay, well, this guy's starting to get a little bit annoying now and uncomfortable. Let's see if, uh... Remember how to do this. Uh, let's see. Uh, huh, okay, like something like that. Ah, yeah, right, right, right. It's a little bit different when you want to get rid of them. All right, three, two, one. All right, perfect. Ah, feels good. You never know what you have or how good you feel until you lose it. You know. You know what I mean? All right, let's continue. Now, it seems we're asking the right questions, with the whole goat's head being in a weird and awkward position on the lion's body. So let's look at the possibilities of when and where this strange extra part came into being. Looking up to the skies, we find the Chimera identified with the lion constellation in the 19th century Italian, more complex representation of the zodiac symbolism. Its flaming breath being a more logical representation of summer, and its three parts being the other three seasons of the year. Kima of the word Chimera means winter in Greek, which before meant goat. So is that the part of the creature representing winter? The Chimera so strange, so fearsome, with its hissing snake tail and the roaring maned lion front, and the bleeding of an angry goat? A goat? By the way, if you ever wondered what the verb is of what a goat says, yes, it's a bleat. Bleat. Goats bleat. The bleeding goat. So maybe this wasn't a goat head originally. Maybe they were, say, wings? Wings! Wait, what? You say? At least I really hope you said that so I can continue this fantastic investigation 
Yes, wings. Now we enter the world of Egypt and Babylon, where we find many images of winged lions, and as in the soon-to-be-presented Greek heroic battle with the chimera, there is also a heroic depiction of Ninurta, a Mesopotamian god, battling a very similar-looking winged lion. A first correlation in our journey that may be telling us that we're on the right path here. Later in this ambiguous timeline, we find depictions of the lion with its foreleg opened out, with its finger-like claws fanning out, sort of like this. Instead of being both one way, one is going outward. Just check out this image. So now you may see the silhouette of the goat's head, just barely if you squint your eyes and look at the image from a distance. What say you? Do you think the silhouette of the goat's head looks more like wings on the lion's back or the clawed arm or leg extending outwards? Oh, but now going backwards in our timeline, instead of seeing the previous two heroic figures dealing with the lion, or the chimera, we see this Persian king overcoming it. Fascinating. What does that tell us about the history in that region? New civilizations taking over and replacing previous cultures' legends with their characters of nobility? Has this happened anywhere else ever? Has it happened in the religions that millions follow today? Hmm. No doubt, do your research before you begin worshipping something that has been altered and manipulated by every succeeding culture and human power in our history. Okay, okay, now we're losing ourselves to more serious matters. Let's get back to monsters. Let's return ourselves to the crazy zaniness of the chimera that obviously has more to teach us than the idea that humans have always had wild imaginations. So not only had the front legs started to appear in an odd position, but also the tail as it started to peek forward from underneath the feline's body. Basically going backwards as you see dogs when they're frightened, they put their tail between their un and under their legs. So we started seeing the depictions as you can see me trying to show you while I'm showing you the image. Which one should you look at? Well, look at both. Basically the tail coming out up and from under the middle of the tail. Just, just look at the picture. So now not only can the fluffiness of the tip of the tail be mistaken for a snake's head as we mentioned before, but also a goat's head with that extra extra fluffiness. And also ancient Sumerian reliefs show this lion spouting fire just like a chimera in this ancient image of land fertility. Looking at this possible evolution of images, it appears that the winged lion may indeed be the origination of the chimera. As you have seen, the chimera concept is in itself a hybrid of not just many animals, but many meanings, from fertility to storms, to the representation of total evil. The chimera and all its lore has far more to it than the Greeks would lead us and would have led us to believe. If the winged lion is indeed the origin of the chimera, then that is a whole topic for another video. For now, let's briefly explore the Greek tale involving the chimera and then, as always, have some fun breaking down and analyzing this fantastic creature. Now, the Greek myth fathered by Typhon, who some call the king of monsters, and the equally as fearsome Echidna. It comes as no surprise that this chimera spawn appears so twisted, for its creators have also brought forth the Cerberus, Sphinx, Hydra, and many others. This beast was placed in Lukia, where it wreaked havoc over the lands with its fiery breath, torching local camps to the ground. Now being a Greek tale, we have to find out who the hero is who put the monster into its eternal sleep. Well, his name was, is, this is World of Monsters, time has no place here. Time. Place. A plaything of a human, Bellerophon was having an affair with Antea, a queen. But when Bellerophon broke off the guilty pleasures, Antea, furious, turned to her husband, King Protus, and tried to convince the king to kill their guest. Though jealous, Protus could not do it. So he sent Bellerophon to Lucia, where he secretly requested the king there to kill Bellerophon, but the king of Lucia, Iobates, was reluctant as well. It was over a week when the Lucian king realized that he could use this opportunity to possibly deal with a treacherous chimera. Either way, one problem would be solved, unless of course both died in the battle, after which the king could soundly sleep. 
Bellerophon was well prepared, seated upon his pegasus. They flew above all the claws, jaws, snarls, and flames of the chimera, and some say fired arrows onto it until its fall. But I don't think so, as more sources say that the arrows didn't work as the chimera burned, melted, and diverted them out of the way. Bellerophon took out a spear that either had a lump of lead attached to the tip of it, or the tip of the spear was made out of lead. Either way, he lunged the spear into the mouth of the chimera, suffocating, piercing, and melting away its innards. Ooh, that's gotta hurt. Now there's always more drama to be found within these Greek tales, but here at World of Monsters, we're mainly and mostly focused on the mythic creature at hand. For if the guidance of a trusty soothsayer and Minerva hadn't occurred, then the Pegasus would not have been part of this heroic ensemble, and therefore Bellerophon's days would have been much more short-lived. Alright, now we go into the free frolicking section of the video where we do countless analysis and, and the sciences and all these beloved things that we do here. So let's go into the appearance of this creature more in depth and give out some crazy cool ideas of possible chimeras to our creatives out there. If you haven't noticed, I do say chimera and chimera all throughout the video so you feel comfortable saying it the way you want it, chimera. Alright, appearance. It's a three-creature hybrid. Lion, goat, and snake. First, let's talk about the positioning of the heads. The goat's head does have a bit of a funky positioning in the traditional, original concepts of the chimera, but it's also quite cool and different from a lot of creatures out there. So yes, of course, we can put the goat's head in the front alongside of the lion's head, or for more double takes, we could keep it right in the middle there. Now, being a hybrid, as always, we can explore different creatures creating this monster. I would say try to keep them within the same animal families. For example, we have the lion from the feline family, we have the snake from the reptile family, and then we have the goat from the bovid family. So therefore, if we change up the heads and the creatures, instead of the lion, we could have a tiger, we could have a leopard, we could have a cheetah and the cheetah's body, a much lighter, fast-paced chimera. We could also have the jaguar body, creating a very agile, muscular chimera. We can also have the snow leopard, giving it this wonderful white-colored fur coat. Then with the reptile part, the snake, we could change that into, of course, the cobra head. Or as some mentioning, a dragon's head, as dragons are, or can be, easily relatable to reptiles. So let's go with the crocodile head. Let's go with lizard heads, uh, a cool iguana head. Iguanas have these cool features which make them very popular with the dewlip and the spikes on the back of the head. Well, how about a chameleon head? Mm, that could be a little bit too silly. But then again, why not create a cool, crazy, silly chimera? A turtle's head? Okay, now we're getting off the point of the chimera being a whole fearsome creature. Uh, how about the goat's head? We can have an antelope. We can have a moose if it's going to be a massive, large creature, as moose are the largest of the deer family. Looking at different deers, looking at uh, the American antelope, the pronghorn. Combining that in with the cheetah, since those are the two fastest land creatures of their regions, and well, one of them, the world, our world. Or maybe even looking into the other bovids, such as buffalo and bison, or maybe a defenseless lamb. Or create mythical creatures that correspond with the families, as I just mentioned, the dragon, or a purple striped cat, a multi-horned antelope, some crazy worm-like snake concepts with horns running down their backs and multiple tongues. And of course, the acid-spitting ability. Now, if you lose control on hybridization, such as the modern term suggests, chimera meaning a genetically modified single organism composed of cells from different zygotes, zygotes or creature genetics. Then basically you can go along the lines of, as many other people and artists have, calling any mixed up hybrid monstrosity a chimera. We see this often in modern games and movies, but then where does the essence of the original chimera concept go? Do we have to resort to calling it a traditional chimera? I propose as an artist, as a designer, as a creator, coming up with a new and original name for such a hybrid that barely relate to the original concept of the chimera, even though it may sell or capture attention better, all for the respect of the original chimera. 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 Thank you for watching part one of All About the Chimera. 
Click the annotations on the screen or follow the links below for part two. And be sure to stop by AJ Pickett's channel for more monstrous fun.